At this time, then we'll ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. This is the story of a man who uh, sought medical aid because he had puffs and ringing in his ears. So he went to doctor number one. Doctor number one told him that he needed his tonsils out. Tonsils out, still had puffy eyes and ringing in his ears. Went to the next doctor. The next doctor suggested that the man's teeth need to be extracted. He wasn't sure about that one, but uh, so he went to a third doctor. The third doctor gave him a thorough exam, and after the thorough exam was over, he looked at him and said, you have six months to live. Well, despairingly with that kind of diagnosis, he decided that he was going to live extravagantly in his only six months left. So he brought a lot of new expensive things, new expensive car, hired a chauffeur, bought new suits and shoes, and even decided that he would have new shirts made by a tailor. So he went to the shirt maker and the tailor, and uh, the tailor said, yes, sir, let's get your measurements going here. 34 sleeve, got that down, and uh, measured your collar, uh, 16 collar. And the guy said, no, 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 that's not right, it's 15 collar. And he said, no, sir, it's 16 collars. He put the measure around again. He said, but I've always worn a 15 collar, and that's how I want these shirts made. And the tailor said, uh, well, don't say that I didn't warn you, because if you continue wearing a 15 collar, your eyes are going to puff and you'll have ringing in your ears. <laughs> so, we need a new look at prayer to see if we are substandard and whether we're choking off the greatness of what prayer should be. They're listed on the back of your bulletin, but you can take, take note of these. Number one is we're talking about Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Don't pray crazy. And when you pray, you, you are not to be like hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues, on the street corners, in order to be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. No religion has ever had the highest uh, a high standard and priority for prayer that Judaism has. As God's chosen people, they are the chosen people of God. They're the recipients of the written word of God, entrusted with the oracles of God, as Romans chapter 3 talks about. God spoke directly to Abraham and to many of his descendants, and they, in many times, spoke directly back to God. No other people as a race or as a nation has ever been so favored by God to have such direct, wonderful communication with God. Of all people, they should have known then, if that communication is there, they should have known how to pray. But they did not. And like every other aspect of their religious life, their praying had been corrupted. And was perverted many times by the rabbinic teaching that was being taught. And most Jews were completely confused about how you pray to God. Now, the Pharisees were obliged to pray so many times a day. They took care that it always seemed to happen when they were in the midst of a crowd. Or were, they were very ostentatious in their manner of prayer. They would give themselves to prayer, but Jesus says, you should not be like them. He says, don't be like the hypocrites. And their motive here, as he says in the verse, is that they wanted to be known for their praying. And Jesus said, they have their reward there. Our Lord did not say, now let me just say, he didn't say it was wrong to pray on the street corner or on the street. He didn't say, uh, but he says, what is your motive for why you are doing this? One commentator observed that the greatest danger to our faith is that the old self simply becomes religious. In other words, that we just religiousize something that we do. In other words, uh, and you've heard this. I, I, I've heard it. I just heard it this past week. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm in church. You know, I'm a good whatever, and I'm, uh, you know, we sing and we go there. And but uh, does that make me a Christian? Does that make me a person as follower of God? In other words, they became religious. And the hypocrites of whom Jesus speaks have convinced themselves that they are performing these things. All of these religious things, these acts, whether it includes types of prayer, that this doing these things is acceptable to God. And people today still do the same thing. They deceive themselves into thinking that they're Christians when all they're doing is sort of dressing up the old nature. 
Remember, prayer is not so sacred that Satan doesn't try to invade it. There's no holy ground on which Satan doesn't try to get a foothold. There's no sacred ground for Satan. He invades it all. The two greatest times of temptation for Jesus, when he was, which he experienced in his life, was when he was alone. Remember out in the desert, he was alone, communing with God, and that's where Satan came and did the temptations. The other temptation took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. There in that private place, in that time of agony, and there again, Satan is there to attack him. The lesson here is don't think that because you have gone to the place of prayer that you have avoided the enemy. He will dog your steps. The hypocrites love to stand and pray. That's what the verse says. Standing was a, standing was a normal position for prayer among Jews. In the Old Testament, you had God's faithful. They would pray kneeling. They would pray lying prostrate on the ground, or they would also stand. Where in the New Testament, it seems the more common position was always about standing. Uh, and the, it, it, there's a part where maybe that's an indication, is it a desire to be noticed? The synagogues were the most appropriate place for prayer to take place. The street corners were also a normal place for prayer because devout Jews would stop. In other words, they would come to a point in time in the day when they were to pray, and wherever they were, they seemed to know when that time was, the, uh, they would, at the appointed hour, would pray. And they would do it even if they were walking down the street or visiting at a corner. It's interesting that the word that is used in this verse is major street or boulevard. In other words, it seemed like I want to get where the most people are when I pray. There was nothing wrong with praying at a major intersection, if that is where you happen to be at the time of prayer, but something was very much wrong if you planned to be there for the specific purpose of sort of showing off. And the real evil of these hypocritical worshipers, whether in the synagogue or on the street corner, was the desire to display to make their prayer a demonstration. Matthew 6, verse 5, for they love to pray. Well, why do they love to pray? Did they love to pray because they love God? Or was it more that they love to pray so that they could be seen by people? Jesus wants to deal with the motive of our prayer. We may never unscramble all the mystery of prayer, but we can certainly deal with the issue of motive. Our prayers are not offered to men, but we are offering to God. We're not supposed to fake it. We're supposed to have the right motive. We're not supposed to pretend we're talking to God. There was a small college town, and in this small college town there was a tavern. And the tavern many times was frequented by students that came from the school. And uh, the tavern decided to put in the campus paper, to put an ad in the campus paper, because it, it was in the days just before parents' weekend. Parents were going to be coming to school to visit their kids. And uh, so the ad that was put in the campus paper was this. Bring your parents to lunch on Saturday. We'll pretend we don't know you. <laughs> the ad was challenged by the college chaplain who posed a revised version. He posted it on the campus bulletin board outside, and it read, bring your parents to chapel Sunday. We'll pretend we do know you. <laughs> a, lot of pretend a lot of pretending going on. Is Jesus saying that public prayer is wrong? Absolutely not. There's nothing wrong with praying out loud in church. There, the issue is not public versus private. The key issue is who are you praying to? Or who are you praying for? Is it about showboating prayer, pretend prayer? The, the Pharisees made it a practice to pray in public places to show others that they were praying. In other words, they wanted to show, look how pious I am. Look how spiritual I am. Who's getting the attention by that kind of prayer? Don't pray crazy. Number two, don't pray lazy. Verse six, but you, when you pray, go into your, uh, go into your inner room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. Verse six, 
Jesus' teaching here is simple. The phrase, when you pray, implies great latitude. It's not talking about a prescribed time or occasion. But it's the idea of when you do this, and he talks about this inner room. And the inner room could be any kind of small room or a chamber or even a, even a storage closet. Such rooms were often places that were secret because many times that's where very expensive things were stored, possessions to be protected. And the idea here of what he's saying here is going to go into the most private place available. Now, prayer and solitude is a wonderful discipline to be practiced, but this verse is not limiting it to a, that kind of narrow interpretation. By the way, it's possible to close the door even when you're with other people. The point is to pray in such a way that we close out everything else and you can pray privately in a crowded mall. Even among office workers or a room full of classmates. The primary point Jesus makes does not have to do with the location, it has to do with our attitude. And if necessary, Jesus says, go to the most secluded private place that you can so that you won't be tempted to show off. Go there, shut the door, shut out everything else so that you can concentrate on God. Do whatever you do to get your attention away from yourself and to get your attention on God. Now, Jesus says if we are captured by knowing this Father, the Father who is better than we can imagine, who longs for us more than we would ever understand, and he is the one who is waiting for us in that quiet place, we will go there to be with him for his sake, not caring at all whether anybody else knows about it. In other words, Jesus says we shut the door, we close off the distractions. We, we push the calendar away. We shut the door away from the phone and the TV and the radio and the computer to go and to be with him. And our father then sees in secret. The difficulty with this is that we need to recognize that our father is unseen. When we, when we enter into his presence, we don't see his form or hear him, so we can't read his body language. All of us have experienced that. A lot of conversations that we have had with somebody else are predicated on the response of the person that we are talking to. If you're talking to someone and they smile and they're engaging and they're leaning forward and they're showing that they want to hear more, then that stimulates you to say more. But if they're yawning and... Oh, now I didn't say about any of you. No? Okay. Uh, that their body language is negative, then it sort of withdraws. And the problem that we have is that we don't see the response of the Father to our prayer. So praying, praying to Him is an act of faith. His invisibility leads us, though, to honest expression. The Father being in secret does not mean he is not present when we pray in public or with our families or a small group. He's very much present wherever, wh whoever his children, wherever they are. And the most important secret he sees is not the words we say in the privacy of our room, but the thoughts that are taking place in the privacy of our heart. And when God is genuinely the audience of our prayer, we will have only the reward that he is there that he gives to us. Jesus gives no idea in this passage as to what the reward is. The important truth is that God is faithful and unfailingly blesses those who come to him in sincerity. There's a guy named Tiger Woods. I'm a golfer. None of you maybe know about golf, but you do know the name Tiger Woods. It's interesting. Tiger Woods will be inducted into the Golf Hall of Fame next year. And the interesting thing about Tiger and his championships, but he has been the, one of the only players in modern era to ever hold all four major championships at one time, back in 2000. U.S. Open champion turned broadcaster Ken Venturi looked dazed as he was talking on his microphone, talking about what Tiger is about to do and winning the fourth one. He says, something that I never dreamed of, nothing that I ever thought would ever take place, one of the greatest feats in all of sports. And as Tiger sank the final putt, Venturi said, you have just witnessed a miracle. 
when Tiger was interviewed, uh, he gave a much needed uh, understanding of that it wasn't a miracle. But rather, he performed in public the way he practiced in private. And he talked about it that very moment. He talked about one of the holes on number 13. He said, I knew that I was going to play that hole in number 13. And I knew that four months ago that I was going to play that hole. And so I've been practicing that shot for number 13. I've been practicing that for at least a couple months. And you think of that, not practicing just for a few days or a few weeks, but practicing that shot for months. And Tiger's success in golf was directly attributed to the thousands of hours that he was willing to practice the game in the secret place. And thus the public performance is shown. The private prayer life of us as Christians should define our public lives, not vice versa. And the goal of prayer should never be the roaring approval of the crowd, but it should be the approval of our Father in heaven. Jesus said, when you pray, go in your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. The secret to prayer is secret prayer to a listening Father. Number three, do not pray hazy, verse seven. And when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. A particular fault Jesus singles out here is that of meaningless repetition. This practice was common in many pagan religions of the day, and as is in many religions even today, including even some parts of Christ Christianity. The scribes and Pharisees used a great deal of repetition in their public display of piety, but many other Jews used it even in their private prayer life. Some have used repetition because their leaders have taught them that. Others uh, resort to repetition because it's easy. In other words, it doesn't demand a lot of thought. I'm going to just say, God bless you, God bless you, you know. To such people, prayer was simply a matter of required religious ceremony. I just need to kneel here, say these words, and I'm done. And uh, as long as it was officially approved, one pattern, the feeling was as good as another. Their problem is, is that they think the formulations of the words are of supreme importance. In other words, they would memorize phrases and learn certain types of prayer and, and use them to speak in specific situations. For instance, one type of prayer was for meals, one type of prayer was for sunrise. In other words, they would say the words over and over again. Their prayer succeeded based on the degree of intensity. How much intensity should I put into my prayer? So yelling would be better than just conversational. So uh, I need to stand outside and yell these prayers. And if I do it 50 times, that's better than doing it 10 times. And the words are nothing, it's just the formula. But what God really wants is conversation, real communication between a father and his child. Now the Jews had picked up some of this practice from the Gentiles who believed that the value of prayer was largely a matter of quantity. In other words, the longer the better. And he says it in the verse. They suppose that they will be heard for their many words. And those who prayed to pagan gods thought that their deities, first of all, when you're talking to foreign deities, they thought, first of all, they had to be woken up. They had to be aroused. We've got to yell at them. We've got to control them. Where are you? And then we have to uh, intimidate them, or we have to badger them. And then we have to, how do we know when we know that God is listening to me? How do I know if he doesn't listen that he can't answer? All you have to do is take the story of 1 Kings 18, and the prophets of Baal and Elijah out, up there on Mount Carmel. Very interesting place. And Elijah cajoles the prophets of Baal and says, well, maybe he's on a trip. Maybe you're gone. Maybe Baal is gone somewhere. That's why you can't. That's why he can't hear you. In the New Testament, there's a similar practice that took place. It uh, takes place in Acts chapter 19, and Paul and his companions uh, were, uh, Demetrius and the silversmiths of Ephesus, uh, were denouncing what Paul was saying, and so they began to chant, began to chant, because Paul was speaking against their God, and their God was Artemis. And so they began to chant, the whole crowd, say, Great, great is Artemis of the, of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis. And they, would, they went on for two hours like that. 
And so the idea is, again, this repetition, repetition, repetition. You know, it's interesting, if you've ever seen Buddhists, Buddhists have these little wheels that they spin, and they put their prayers inside the wheel, and then as they, they don't have to talk them, they just have to spin the wheel. And every time the wheel goes round, the prayer is going up. In other words, they just believe each turn of the wheel, I'm sending my prayer to God, or to a God. It's interesting, Roman Catholics, the rosaries, counting off prayers, Hail Mary, Our Fathers, it's interesting that the rosary came to Catholicism from Buddhism by the way of Spanish Muslims during the Middle Ages. Even in our own world, we have charismatic groups that do the same. The repeating of words. I, I can't think of what I'm supposed to say, so I'll just say, I don't know. Well, that was, uh, that was speaking in tongues right there. Uh, in other words, it, did, it degenerates into unintelligible confusion. And all of us, of course, have been guilty of repeating the same prayers meal after meal, prayer meeting after prayer meeting, with little or no thought of what we are saying or of the one that we're talking to. In other words, prayer that is thoughtless and indifferent is offensive to God. It should also be offensive to us. Oftentimes we just pray, you know, and recite little prayers cliches that we've heard and we we hear others say them they sound pretty good so we'll use them bless the church bless the missionaries bless the sick guide us guard us direct us and a lot of it is because we don't even know what we are saying but rather we pray we are to pray from the depths of our heart understanding what's going on with sincerity. Remember the story about a little boy who was afraid to go to the dentist. And so his dad took him to the dentist. And like a good dad, he was going to show him that he didn't have to be fearful about getting in the chair and setting the example. And Here's the dentist leaning over the dad and opening his mouth, looking inside, and the dentist looks inside the father's mouth and says, uh-oh, there's a tooth that needs to be pulled. Now, his father wasn't exactly expecting that that was what was going to happen about going to the dentist for his son. And the father said, well, how, how, but okay, how, how much will it cost? And the dentist said, It'll, we charge $85 a tooth. And the father asked, well, how long will it take you to pull the tooth? And the dentist replied by saying, uh, it'll be, take about a minute. And the father sort of protested and said, I, 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 get, I get paid by the hour. And when I think of paying somebody $85 for a minute's work, that sure seems like a very high hourly wage. So the dentist said, well, I can pull the tooth more slowly if you want. Sometimes we think that about prayer. Sometimes we think that the longer that we pray, the more spiritual we are. Jesus says, don't just babble on endlessly, but be sincere in your prayer. Prayer that depends on a formula is not real prayer. The concern that God has is how we say it. Uh, it's not how we say it, but what is behind the words. Some people, uh, some people hesitate to pray because they don't know the right words. God's not concerned about that. God doesn't care about the quality of the language, but it is what's happening in your heart. The sincerity of your heart, that's what he cares about and what he's listening to. Now, we must be careful here. We must not jump to wrong conclusions. Jesus did not forbid the repetition of genuine requests in the parable of the midnight visitor goes to his neighbor and asks for help. Uh, Jesus praises him uh, as being persistent before God. In the parable, persistent widow that goes to the judge and continues to ask the judge for help. And her persistence is pointed out by Jesus uh, even to an ungodly judge. 
Paul entreated the Lord three times about the thorn in the flesh that he had. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus is facing the agony of the cross and he goes before his father. He says, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. If not, let it be your will. And he does it the one time, but then he goes to the disciples and he comes back, does it a second time. He goes a third time in Matthew 26. He prays the, that prayer three times. It's not honest, properly motivated repetition of needs or praise before God that is wrong, but it's the mindless, indifferent recital of spiritually sounding words or magical formulas. Not only must our hearts be right before God and you will hear our prayer, but also our minds. Thoughtless prayer is offensive to God. Don't pray hazy. Lastly, number four, do pray simply. Verse 8, therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. In other words, you don't have to badger God, you don't have to con God, you don't have to force him into a corner. Uh, man, i got to do this so this guy will stop praying. God, God isn't interested in the length of the repetition of your prayer, just the purity. God knows your needs. God knows your needs. You don't have to badger and beat him into submission. Some people would ask at this point, well then, what's the purpose of prayer? What is prayer? If we're not informing God or letting him know things, what is prayer? Prayer, more than anything else, is sharing the needs, the burdens, the hungers of your heart with God. It isn't getting things or forcing God to do something. It's just opening your soul to him because you're opening it to yourself to one who cares about you. Prayer is saying, oh God, I come to you with the needs of my heart. In other words, I'm saying to God, God, I want the, uh, I'm sharing my needs and I want you to display your glory in these. Let me see your power. Let me see your majesty. In other words, when I pray these prayers and then I see your answer, then I can praise you. That is why we share those prayers. That's why we say those prayers. And with that, we have the opportunity to see God in his glory take and use them. We want what he wants. What is God asking? Well, he's saying, first of all, pray with a devout heart, pure motive. Secondly, he pray, says, pray with a humble heart. Our attention is on God. Thirdly, he says, pray with a confident heart knowing that God will do these things in a childlike simplicity. You know, in our fast food culture, uh, we are forever looking for instant. We want it now. And the promise of quick fix, instant cures, when it really, when in reality there are none. We need to understand, like, the secret to a successful marriage is time spent developing a relationship with your spouse. The secret to raising kids is time spent and the quality and the quantity of time that we spend relating to our kids. And the secret to prayer is exactly the same. It's what Jesus said, it's quantity and quality. And when you pray, he says, go into your room, shut the door, and then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. In other words, so he's saying to us, get alone with God, remember who the focus is, the focus is upon God. And then out of that, he says, you will receive the reward of God. First of all, of his presence, you receive the reward of God's provision. You receive the reward of God's power. The great verse here is the passage that we read, Ephesians 3. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. In other words, that's the kind of God that you're praying to. To him be glory. In Christ Jesus throughout all generations. May he do great and mighty things in your life for his glory. Let's bow in prayer. I'm thankful for you, our great and powerful God, that you desire us to come to you and to bring our prayers and our needs and our concerns. It's interesting that you, our God, invite us to have the conversation with you. And even though we can't see you, we can realize that we have a God who has shown his love and care for us. And then we know that that same God is caring for us today. 
May we, uh, may we enjoy your presence. May we receive joy in coming into you and the delight that we have of coming into the very throne room of our God. Thank you for the invite. May you help us as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.